Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting video 25.1 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This video discusses acute vessel closure. Acute vessel closure is one of the three main categories of coronary complications, the other two being perforation and equipment loss or entrapment. Acute vessel closure has several potential causes, such as dissection, thrombosis, embolization, occlusion of a side branch during bifurcation standing, coronary spasm, pseudo lesions, entrapment of equipment or stand deformation, intramural hematoma, as well as aortic dissection, which is typically not a complication of PCI, but can manifest as acute coronary syndrome. And all these causes are described in detail in the book and will be presented in this video briefly and in subsequent videos as well. Overall, if there is acute vessel closure, the priorities are number one, to maintain wire position, assuming of course that a wire had been placed in the coronary vessel prior to the occurrence of the acute vessel closure. The second one is to determine the cause, because the treatment can be diametrically opposite for example, for dissections, the treatment is to place a stent, but if there is embolization, placing a stent is actually contraindicating because it's going to worsen the distal embolization. Therefore, having a differential diagnosis is critical for targeting the treatment and getting the best possible results. And then finally, when acute vessel closure occurs, depending on the location of vessel occlusion, Hemodynamic instability can ensue, and in some cases, hemodynamic support may be needed. So, brief overview in this video of the potential causes, starting with dissection. There will be a separate video dedicated on dissections. But uh, broadly, dissection uh, can, can have various complications depending on the location, as well as uh, how badly is the coronary flow affected. For example, a dissection here in the left main affecting the LAD, the circumflex. This is going to have major hemodynamic consequences. Patient is likely to arrest and require placement of VA ECMO. There is a classification of dissections, the NHLBI. Categorize them from type A to type F, type F being complete occlusion. Type A being a luminal haziness with a minor radiolution areas. B has a linear dissection. C, there is some extra luminal contrast staining. D is a spiral dissection. E is dissection with persistent filling defects. And again, F is complete vessel occlusion. Patients can actually present with a coronary dissection. There are the patients with spontaneous coronary dissection or SCAD in whom, if uh, possible, PCI should be avoided because their vessels are friable and it's possible to extend the dissections. This is an example of such a case in which uh, LAD had the culprit lesion, but then during standing there was acute occlusion of the left main, the patient arrested, requiring placement of VA ECMO. On the other hand, this is an example of a dissection of a small non-dominant right coronary artery. There is still undergrade flow. No specific treatment was performed and the patient had an uneventful recovery. What causes dissection? Injection when there is dampened pressure is one of the main causes and that is why it is important to always look at the pressure before as well as after injecting contrast. Non-coaxial guide position, sometimes wiring through a very tight lesion or an ulcerated lesion can lead to dissection. Sometimes dissections can happen because of lesion preparation with balloons or atherectomy. Sometimes balloon rupture can cause it. And then um, this is more likely to occur if uh, the lesions are heavily calcified or tortuous. As we discussed, some patients do present with spontaneous coronary dissection. Consequently, how to prevent dissections? Most importantly, do not inject if there is pressure dampening. This is some of the simple basic rules of coronary angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention that should be respected in all cases. Get as coaxial guide position as possible, avoid aggressive wire maneuvers, and then avoid using oversized balloons and high inflation pressures. And when there are calcified lesions, adequate preparation prior to standing is important as well. So what to do if dissection occurs? The key question is whether there is a wire in the vessel 
If there is, the treatment is a stent. If not, then what should try to wire through the segment and confirm that the wire is actually into the distal true lumen. If it is, then stenting is performed. In, if not, if the patient has a small vessel that has dissection, potentially conservative management may be appropriate, but if it's a major vessel, sometimes emergency coronary bypass may be required. Moving on to another kind of complication. This is a patient who has a major aortocoronary dissection. This likely occurred due to contrast injection despite some dampening in the ostium of the right coronary. What is the next step? And the next step is anything except injecting contrast. The worst thing you can do for aortocoronary dissections is to inject contrast that can actually expand the area of dissection and the subintimal hematoma. There's a separate video for this, but again, the number one thing is to not inject. Number two, place a stent protruding all the way to the ostium of the vessel, post dilated accurately, and that in most cases will suffice to treat this complication. Moving on to vessel thrombosis, the most common causes for this are inadequate anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy and suboptimal lesion preparation. Actually, one of the major causes of stent thrombosis is a suboptimal result after stenting. How to prevent it? By using optimal anticoagulation. Typically, the ACT should be more than 300 seconds in patients without 2B3 inhibitors and between 200 and 250 seconds in patients on 2B3 inhibitors or cangrelor. Then ensuring that there is adequate antiplatelet therapy. If possible, pre-treat the patient with antiplatelet agents. And then for achieving an excellent result by um, using intravascular imaging and ensuring that the good lesion and stent expansion has been achieved. This is an example of a patient uh, who underwent a complex uh, PCI of the LAD and then a few hours later developed uh, acute stent thrombosis. How to deal with stent thrombosis? The first step is to check the ACT, perform thrombectomy, especially if there is large thrombus burden, then balloon angioplasty and stenting. So in this particular case, um, there was uh, aspiration, thrombectomy, the patient was given epifibadite, intravascular imaging was performed, ensuring that good stent expansion was achieved, and then the patient was maintained on prasugrel afterwards. Moving on to coronary embolization. Embolization can happen with thrombus, plaque, or air, and uh, thrombus is uh, prevented, as we discussed in the previous section, plaque. Embolization can happen, especially in repeat Leach lesions or in saphenous vein graft or ACS precutaneous coronary intervention. And then air embolization usually happens because of poor catheter and manifold preparation. This is an example of a patient who had PCI of the middle AD and suddenly developed chest pain and ST segment elevation. There is this typical back and forth movement of contrast through the recently placed stand. This is typical, although not always diagnostic, of uh, no reflow. This is another example in which um, there is massive air embolism, which uh, is known to lead to cardiac arrest, which is actually what happened in this patient. And again, this will be discussed uh, in uh, separate videos. But if thrombus is the problem, then thrombectomy is performed, followed by balloon angioplasty and stenting. If plaque is embolized, then aspiration is done with vasodilators. And if air embolization is the problem, oxygen is given. And then if needed, aspiration can be done and vasodilators can be uh, given as well. Also, in cases of cardiac arrest, post-embolization, intracoronary epinephrine may actually uh, help uh, restart the heart. Cause number four for acute vessel closure is uh, occlusion of a side branch during bifurcation staining. This is discussed in detail in video 16.2 uh, about uh, provisional bifurcation staining. But the bottom line is uh, if uh, this happens, it is critical to have a wire in the side branch. If this is the case, the side branch is rewired or if needed, a balloon can be advanced over the jail wire and inflated to restore some flow. If there is no wire in the side branch, that can be a problem. And that is why, in most cases, it is best to have a wire in any important sign branch prior to deploying a stand in the main vessel. 
Spasm is another cause of acute vessel closure. This is a patient with severe lesion, distal RCA, posterior lateral vessel. All these lesions disappeared after intracoronary intra nitroglycerin. That emphasizes the point that nitroglycerin should be given in all patients before coronary angiography unless there is a contraindication such as hypotension. Pseudolesions is another potential cause of uh, acute vessel closure, and this happens when equipment is advanced through highly tortuous vessel due to straightening of the vessel from the advanced equipment. This is an example. This is a tortuous LAT. A stiff uh, wire is advanced through this, and now there appears to be a new lesion in the middle LAT that was not there before. However, after removing the wire back, there is no lesion anymore. This was all due to straightening of the vessel from the guide wire. This is another example. This is a tortuous lima. A microcatheter and wire were advanced through the lima, and that led to acute lima occlusion. And then after the wire and the microcatheter will pull back, the lima is actually fine. Of course, when this first happens, one is to make sure that it is indeed pseudolesion and not dissection of the lima that is causing the problem. And that is why sometimes the best way to find out is to pull the wire not all the way back, but have the soft distal portion of the wire through the area of occlusion, perform angiography, and confirm that this was actually pseudolesion. Equipment entrapment is another cause of acute vessel closure, and this uh, will be discussed uh, in separate videos. Intermural hematoma can happen either spontaneously in scar patients, as we discussed, but also can happen after balloon angioplasty or standing. The way to prevent this is to accurately size the stents, avoid very high pressures, and then when you post dilate, limit the balloon inside the stent to avoid the risk of uh, distal dissections proximal and distal to the stem. How to treat it? If it's a small non-flow limiting hematoma, sometimes observation suffice. There have been some cases in which a cutting balloon was used to release the hematoma, but in most cases stents are placed, ensuring that uh, covering distally first so there is no more distal expansion of the hematoma. This is an example of a patient who underwent stenting of the proximal LAD, and now there is a new filling defect in the mid LAD, and this is a typical IVUS appearance of intramural hematoma at the distal edge of the stent. This was treated with a placement of an additional stent that uh, restored undergrade flow into the LAD. And then a final case that is slightly different. This is a patient who presented in cardiogenic shock. And this is the first image of the left coronary system. We see the left main looks hazy, although there is not much disease in the remaining vessels. What should be done here next? And this was a unique case. This is actually an example of uh, aortic dissection causing compromise of the left main and cardiogenic shock. Aortic dissection is one of the potential causes of acute vessel closure, not iatrogenic, but can happen spontaneously. It is critical to diagnose this early because the patients will need to have emergency aortic surgery to replace the ascending aorta. So to summarize, acute vessel closure can be a dramatic complication. There are three key components if it happens. The first one is to maintain wire position if the vessel that has the, the acute vessel closure has already a wire in it. The second one is to run to the differential diagnosis and determine what is actually causing the acute vessel closure and then treat according to the cause. And again, broadly, dissections require stents, thrombosis and requires adjustment of anticoagulation and antiperlal therapy and optimization of the stent result. Embolization requires aspiration, followed by administration of vasodilators. Balloon angioplasty is needed in case of side branch occlusion. If it's spasm, nitro is given. If it's a delusion, the inciting equipment is removed. And if there's equipment entrapment, this is removed as um, discussed in separate videos. If it's an intramural hematoma that's causing the problem, then typically additional standing is performed. And finally, step three is to assess the hemodynamic impact of the acute vessel closure if it leads to hemodynamic compromise, insertion of a hemodynamic support device may be required. Thank you.